call this what we're doing now, where are we? And I do this because, so I had a friend a long time ago in Rome, and he had just been living there for a while, and I go visit him in Rome, and uh, we're basically lost. And I said, you know, dude, do you know where we're going? He goes, I know exactly where we're going, I just don't know where we are. <laughs> so before you know where you want to get to, before you know where you're going, you got to have the base. You got to know where you are to make those decisions. So today, you know, we're going to have some people doing that for us. So our first speaker today, uh, um, Barney Malekian, he's the uh, CEO, uh, Assistant CEO of, of, of Santa Barbara County for Public Safety. After Barney, John Olgren, who is, uh, I don't know, Ag Zone Ranch, what is it called, Ranch something? He's a ranch economist, I mean a ranch real estate guy, whatever that means, but uh, John knows everything about the ag sector and what's going on in property. And Laurel is at, uh, she's the head of compliance uh, at American Riviera Bank. Please welcome Barney Malekian, thank you. <clears throat> Well, good evening and thanks for being here. I am the uh, Assistant County Executive Officer for Public Safety. Uh, I have spent uh, 45 years of my life in law enforcement in various, uh, various um, roles, the most, uh, most recent of which was to be, the, had the privilege of being the under sheriff in Santa Barbara County for, for nearly four years. So the irony of overseeing cannabis regulation is not lost on me. Uh, so going forward, so today I just want to walk through the history of cannabis legalization because it has been quite a journey. Talk a little bit about our compliance and enforcement efforts in the county. Uh, talk about cannabis operations and taxation and what do we see the challenges that are ahead. One of the realities of, of the whole cannabis legalization process both in the, both in this state and, and specifically in, in this county uh, is that for a variety of reasons, um, the, uh, it was necessary for the county to craft, uh, all counties, not just Santa Barbara County, to craft regulations in a fairly compressed period of time in order to uh, avoid a situation where all the regulations and enforcement would have been dictated by the state. And so what you have is, a, is an industry that, is come, that has been in the shadows of legality for decades and a lot of sincere people trying to come out. But as uh, Peter talked about, as we work this issue through trying to figure out uh, taxation structures and revenue structures and, and how do we deal with the various issues, uh, it's, it is a work in progress. So the history of cannabis legalization essentially goes all the way back to 1996. Uh, the Compassionate Use Act, I'm not, going to read the, I'm not going to read the PowerPoint to you, but it's been a slow and gradual process over the last 20 years to get us to a place uh, where in 2016 the Proposition 64 passed, and then in 2017 the Medicinal and Adult Use of Cannabis uh, act passed. It created the state licensing system and really was the, w really was the first dramatic step to acknowledge what was already a reality, which was the, which was to bring the cannabis market or the cannabis um, system into the open marketplace. Within the county, in 2016, the board prohibited all cannabis operations and I'm going to talk in a little bit about what uh, legal non-conforming uh, means, but essentially uh, there, were, uh, there were medical outfits that under the previous um, state codes were growing medical uh, cannabis for medicinal and medical purposes. Those, uh, and we'll talk about the process in a second, but those businesses that, that attested to the fact that they were doing that were told that under certain circumstances they could continue to do it while they went through the land use and, and business license process. In 2018, the board amended the land use code uh, through a variety of structures to set up zoning for cannabis operations in various areas, including, including the Carpinteria uh, overlay zone or the coastal zone and in the inland areas and, and in, ag, uh, in, in areas that were zoned Ag 1 and Ag 2. And then in 2018, the board also established under a separate ordinance, Chapter 50, uh, the business licensing structure. And within the county government structure, the land use codes are administered by the Planning and Development Department, and the business licensing process is administered by the county executive office. 
to give you some point of comparison, and I know that there are some uh, city representatives here from both Santa Barbara and Goleta, both of whom are sort of working through their own processes, but this is just an example of how the city of Santa Barbara worked through uh, work through their system, and, and the, the county regulations, it's important to note, uh, apply only to the unincorporated areas of Santa Barbara County. So each of the incorporated cities is responsible for developing their own set of regulations. And one of the challenges was that the state said essentially in 2017 that if cities and counties did not draft their own regulations and put them into place, that state regulations and state enforcement would apply. And it was a fairly compressed time frame to do that, which is why uh, there are some challenges with regulations and the need to continually amend them. This is how uh, Santa Barbara City is set up. They're focused essentially on, on both manufacturing and delivery and distribution, as well as, as retail outlets. Uh, again, I'm not going to read that for you, but you can compare this uh, to the county process, which I'll show you in a second. So there are, there are really two, uh, two distinct areas within Santa Barbara County. There is what's called the Carpinteria Overlay Zone, which was actually created before uh, cannabis legalization was an issue. It was really designed to deal uh, with the flower growers and the, and the other agricultural uh, operations that were in place in, in that part of the county. And then essentially when you hear discussion of everywhere else, or inland areas, that's everywhere else outside of the Carpinteria Overlay Zone. So. Anybody that, that, and this was one of the areas that was probably the most controversial in terms of what um, the county uh, chose to do, which was they said that, that anyone who attested to the fact, and we'll talk about the specifics in a minute, but attested to the fact that prior to January 19th, 2016, that they were growing or cultivating medical marijuana, if they attested to that fact and they were going through the county's land use process, they could have, uh, they, they could qualify, the county would support their request for what was then called a temporary license and what would later become to call a provisional license and allow them to continue in business. That process is called legal non-conforming, meaning that their operation is legal, but they are not conforming to the county's land use codes and it is their responsibility to move in the direction of getting in, into compliance with the county's land use codes. Non-conforming status, uh, I think I touched on this uh, basically, but essentially what was said is if they, if they submitted a sworn affidavit that they were doing that business, if they had proof, and one of the distinctions, and we'll talk in a second about the distinction between land use uh, and business licenses, very often the owner of the property is not the person who is, who is operating the cannabis operation. The, in this county, cultivation is a huge piece of what we're doing. Most of the cultivators are not the landowners. The landowners are leasing to the applicants. Uh, so the, pro the, the applicant has to prove that the property owner has approved that um, and that they have an odor control system and a security plan in place. There are three levels of cannabis compliance. The land use permitting, which is overseen by the Planning and Development Department, the business license process, which is overseen by the County Executive Office, and the state licensing, which we'll, I'll show you in a second, is actually overseen by three, uh, three separate state agencies. Land use, the simplest way to explain this is, is that land use and land use permits goes with the land. And it's a fairly permanent process once it lands. Now you're gonna hear some different terms, uh, but outside of the coastal overlay zone, outside of, outside of Carpinteria, for the most part, you apply for a land use permit to cultivate or to grow cannabis. Uh, if you wanna do something more specialized, if you wanna have a production plan, if you wanna have manufacturing, if you want to uh, operate something above that, you may have to get what's called a con conditional use permit. If you hear people talk about the, a coastal development permit, that's just a land use permit inside, inside the coastal zone. But it's essentially the same thing, except that it has to go through, in addition to all the county processes, it has to go through the coastal commission. 
So you have a variety of regulations. The permit runs with the land. And up until recently, uh, essentially, you had to have your land use permit before you could apply for your business license permit. And I'll come back to that in a second because that has created some, some problems because of the length of time very often required to get through the land use permitting process. The business license process goes with the individual. So if, if I get, if I get a, a business license to operate a cannabis cultivation operation and I fail, to comply with the county regulations if I fail to pay my taxes, uh, whatever, my, whatever my mess up is, that business license can be taken away from me. Uh, a land use permit cannot be taken away from the land. Uh, I, can't, I may not be able to run it, but the owner of that land is entitled to go get somebody else to see if they can do it. Uh, the licenses are good for, for one year. They require extensive background checks. And it's, it's actually a very exhaustive process, which is another reason, and we'll talk about some numbers in a minute. But right now, we've only issued five business licenses uh, in the unincorporated area of the county. The licenses are subject to renewal, and there is a process for suspension and revocation and cancellation. Uh, but working, working through that, uh, we're just coming up on our first renewal right now. Uh, and we're still designing the process for how we're going to review that. So the retail storefront is something that at the um, uh, last board meeting in, in, uh, in November, or in December rather, the, um, uh, the board approved this process for retail storefront outlets in the unincorporated area of the county. Uh, there are six, uh, a maximum of six that will be permitted in six distinct what are called community plan areas. Those community plan areas include uh, the Toro Canyon Summerlin area, the Eastern Goleta Valley, the Isla Vista Goleta uh, area, Orchid, uh, Los Alamos, and San Inez Valley. Uh, I'm not going to, I don't have a pointer on this thing anyway, uh, but you can essentially see that, that that's the process that the person has to work through. And once they're qualified with their application, their business operations plan, which is a very complex document, and then a neighborhood compatibility plan, along with a fee, they work through that process and ultimately uh, there is going to be a competitive process for this. Uh, it, it, I anticipate that this process will take 12 to 18 months. Uh, the, um, the very next step, uh, once we, uh, which in the next couple of weeks we'll probably be figuring out where and when, but we, will, we are required to have at least one community meeting in each of the six affected areas uh, and to develop uh, and to learn what the neighborhood and community priorities are. That will then be made part of the competitive process for selecting, um, for selecting um, a candidate. And that's, this is just a, a, the, the ranking process that goes through there. They have to have their land use entitlement and they have to get a retail storefront business license. Um, my expectation is that we will complete the community, uh, the community meetings probably by May uh, and then move into the application scoring process. And this real quickly are the three state regulatory uh, Air, uh, areas or agencies. Uh, the governor is in the process of consolidating those and I don't know uh, specifically that that consolidation will be in effect on July 1st with the new budget and I'm, I'm not 100% sure yet exactly how that's going to work and the people that I've talked to that work in Sacramento aren't exactly sure yet how that's going to work. Um, but they, I think it can't help but be a good thing because it is incredibly complicated right now to navigate the state process. This is just some idea of how many state licenses there are. Um, there won't be a test later, but Peter probably knows all the answers anyway. Um, so, uh, but th this, is, this, is, this is one of the challenges that Peter was talking about. Because there's no question that one of the motivators for doing this was the potential for revenue. And the question is, how do we move to a place where we are maximizing revenue to support government operations, and that's government operations greater than just the process of overseeing cannabis without driving people back into the illegal market? 
And that curve that Peter showed you, I don't, I, I was going to say, I don't think we've found that spot yet. I know we haven't found that spot yet. Uh, and we're still, we're still working through that process. Our enforcement effort in uh, the uh, Santa Barbara County put a lot of emphasis. There are 14 people assigned to enforcement uh, efforts uh, in the county. Uh, and we are actually looked to by, uh, by the state and by other counties throughout the state uh, in, in terms of how aggressive our enforcement has been to try to put people, put the illegal operators and the people who are not maintaining their licenses or not doing uh, the, the, maintaining the permit standards uh, to close those down. This is just a rough map of how many licenses and applications there are uh, in the, in the Carpinteria, in the coast, what's referred to as the coastal zone uh, that runs from, uh, from Carpinteria up towards Gaviota. And this is the same thing for the, for the inland area. And I'll give you some specific numbers to go with those in a second. One of the things that's important when you hear people talk about licenses is to remember that this 1,164 licenses by type are actually held by 96 operators. Uh, there's, a, there's a process that's called license stacking for, and I won't, I won't bore you with, um, uh, with trying to explain that because I, I think it would be a, a recipe for a nap for everybody. But essentially, uh, it, is, um, it is very possible, and they do, for people to hold nursery licenses, for people to hold cultivation licenses, uh, and in some cases, to try to, people have applied for, for retail, but not retail licenses yet, uh, but processing and manufacturing. And so it's, it's, incredibly, uh, it's incredibly complicated to keep, sort, uh, keep track of the individuals and the companies uh, that hold all of these licenses. But that's the breakdown by region. And this is the number of acres, and that's going to be significant with the next slide. Um, but this is essentially by licensed acres. These are people, uh, these are businesses or operations who have been granted their land use permit and they are licensed to cultivate by the state of California. The taxation rate, um, I'll, I'll let you read that. Uh, micro, uh, it runs up the cultivation, which is the bulk of what um, Santa Barbara County, essentially in the unincorporated area has. As cultivation, it's taxed at 4% of gross receipts. There are a variety of taxing methodologies that, uh, that people utilize. Uh, and um, in, in several counties, they were taxed by acres of operation rather than gross receipts. And one of the challenges that we have right now is that the tax rate is still based on, um, on self-reporting. So you all know this typical supply and demand diagram. I'm going to do a very simple one. And this thing, this demand curve, that you've all seen in your you know, high school economics class, let me explain really what it is. What it tells you is how much you're willing to pay for a particular units of this good. That's what it tells you. Most economists, practically all economists, agree that demand curves slope down, meaning if you make things more expensive for people to do, they do less of it. You make airline travel more expensive, people do less of it. You make uh, marijuana taxes more expensive, people do less of it. And if that's your goal, then you, put, you, you raise the price of it. The question is how to raise the price. So this, so that's a supply curve. This comes from firms willing to supply the good. Obviously, the higher price they get, the more they're willing to supply. And then you all know that you know, in, the free, in a free market, and we're going to talk about this later, in a free market, the equilibrium of supply and demand is going to give us equilibrium prices and equilibrium quantity. Fair enough. So that's what it would be in a free market. Now what do taxes do? What taxes do is they distort your decisions to buy this good. So here's an example of an excise tax I'll put on this particular good. I think I'll, yeah, I'll put it in black. So here's the excise tax. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a tax of, say, a dollar on the buyers of this good. Now remember what this demand curve tells you. It tells you the total price you're willing to pay for this, to, to get this good. Well, if there's a dollar tax on it, that means the price you give to the seller is going to be less by a dollar, because you're only willing to buy that many units from your demand curve. So what would happen in this case is the, the demand curve would shift 
down like this, I told you it was a professor hat, um, would shift down like this such that this distance that I just put in here is a dollar. Okay, so now you can see what's happened. What's happened is we're at a new equilibrium, it's here. Where is this new equilibrium with taxes? It's less than the equilibrium that would be there without taxes. So this is the idea of if you don't want people to do something, tax it. And by the way, we could have done it with a subsidy as well. Now what happens? So now, this distance here, I know it's getting crazily complicated. I'll, this distance is tax revenue. It's the per unit tax times the quantity sold. This money, by the way, for cannabis, has been directed by Prop 64 to go to certain places about education, and this year they're predicting it's about $280 million going forward that would, that would be going to uh, uh, education programs, compliance, et cetera. So I just drew that putting a tax. So here's the beautiful thing about this. Forget all this. Here's the beauty of economics, by the way. So the beauty of economics is the following. And people talk about this all the time. It doesn't matter who you put the tax on. It does not matter if you put it on the buyer of the good or the seller of the good. And the way that works is, if I had put it on the seller of the good, the supply curve would have shifted. The point is, if you do it 50-50, half of the tax on the buyer, half on the seller, you get the same outcome. The same outcome is that's a dollar, that distance, which distorts your buying and you get this revenue from, from this good, okay? So, that's the way taxes work. Um, that's why people put taxes on things many times. It does two things. It stops you from buying it, makes you less willing to buy it, and it generates tax revenue. My view as an economist, you shouldn't put, if you're a person who can tax, you shouldn't do it because you want to make money, right? Our politicians and our government should be helping us do things we want to do, not for them to raise money, but that's, all, that's, that's not an economics hat thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I can take off my economics hat. <laughs> okay, how are taxes paid here? Um, it's pretty crazy. Barney's going to talk a little bit more about some of this stuff, but it's pretty convoluted. So this is a picture, and I have a couple pictures from the legislative analyst's office. You can't really see it right away, but this is the way it works. The way it works is the cultivator pays the cultivation tax that I told you, They pay it to the first distributor of the, of the good. So I grow it, I'm a grower, I take my tax and I give it to the distributor. That distributor then takes it and gives the, that tax payment I gave to them to the manufacturer. Who then takes it, who then takes it and gives it to the last distributor. The retail part of it also gives it to the last distributor. So the last distributor of the stuff of, of all this pays the tax to this gigantic organization called the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration. Look how big they are compared to everybody else. <laughs> They're like really big. That seems crazy to me. It's hard for compliance. You've got to test how much was sold by weight. Um, we'll talk about that. How much time do I have left? Two hours? <laughs> I need it. Um, so let's talk about externalities a little bit more, and I'm going to show you the picture. So what are externalities? I told you, private decisions affect others. CO2 emissions, using fossil fuels. That's why we have carbon taxes, or we try to have carbon taxes, to limit the amount of ozone, uh, CO2, that goes into the uh, environment. Yoko Ono songs. Sometimes the radio plays them. And I'm listening to them. It's like an externality. It's like... Sorry if you like Yoko Ono. I just... I can't handle it. Um, odor. People don't like, you know, the smell of the cannabis next to their house, for example. And there's ways to deal with that. And pesticide overspray that I've already mentioned. Now, I gave you that tax diagram for a reason. To show you how we deal with that issue. So this is the same supply and demand diagram, but I already did it for you because I don't have to draw it out. Same thing I just did before. As I told you, that what's going to happen is that the private cost is not going to be equal to the social cost. And by social cost, I mean what we would vote for. We would say, you know what, we don't want so much of this stuff, let's figure it out. So what do we do? 
Well, this is the social cost. This is the amount of pollution in the air or Yoko Ono songs, whatever you want to call it, this is that social cost that's being external to the producer of the good. What do we do? Simplistic. We put a tax on CO2 emissions, on Yoko, the playing of Yoko Ono songs, whatever it is, we put a tax on it. What did that do? That gave us the social optimum, what we voted for. We're never going to get to zero on it, so we're going to have to decide on some amount of it. We never get to zero crime, for example. Um, we need to put a tax on it. And by the way, this is the tax revenue that gets generated from that. What do we mean by tax is a distortion? What we mean by tax is a distortion is the price the buyer pays is different than the price the seller receives, and that difference is the tax. So let's talk a little bit about You've all heard of the Laffer Curve? People heard of the Laffer Curve? A Laffer Curve was, a, uh, I don't know why it's named after this guy. He wasn't such a great economist, Arthur Laffer. I think it was in the Council of Economic Advisors, but um, yeah. Uh, so it's a smart thing, I, you know. Let me show you what a Laffer Curve is. This is a Laffer Curve. He got his name on this curve. Kind of nice, huh? Um, so what does it do? A Laffer Curve is the following. Suppose the government so on, on the horizontal axis is a tax rate. And on the vertical axis is the tax revenue generated from that tax. Suppose the tax is zero. How much revenue does the government get? Zero. Suppose the tax is 100%. They get zero because you wouldn't work anymore. The government, you know, you, they take all your money away. So what happens is if we start at zero and we start to raise the tax rate, we move up this curve in this direction. Why is that? Small taxes, you still do the same thing you did before. Remember I told you taxes distort buying. But for small taxes, you know, 10 cents on a, uh, a gallon of uh, alcohol, no big deal for you. So what happens is the government gets an increase in revenue. And by the way, that keeps happening until you get to some point up here where now the tax really starts to bite. And starts to bite on people such they change their buying behavior, for example. What does that mean? It means you, put a, you, you keep raising the tax rate and they get less and less revenue. And by the way, the whole argument about supply side economics that you may have heard of in the past, about what do we do with taxes and government revenue, it's this thing. This is what they're arguing about. Are we on this side of the curve where we increase taxes and we get more revenue? Or are we on, the, on this side of the curve, if we increase taxes, we get less revenue? So that's the whole idea about, um, uh, like I said, supply side economics, et cetera. How about this one? I have a new one for cannabis. It's called the Laffer Curve. <laughs> it's a cannabis joke. I said I was going to tell any, but I told one. This is the same idea. And the idea is this. If you make legal cannabis so expensive that no one buys it, you're going to get zero revenue from it. If you start to increase taxes um, uh, a little bit, um, you'll probably get some tax revenue from it. And by the way, the tax revenue is going to come, I believe, from two sources. One source is that you know, people aren't going to uh, stop using it so much. And the second one is we're going to start bringing the illegal sector, we're going to get rid of the illegal sector, which again, Barney will talk about a little bit more. The illegal sector is still very big in Santa Barbara County, as many of you know, and someone told me there was a raid this morning. Um, uh, so the illegal sector is still very big. We can get rid of the illegal sector pretty easily. Most people would prefer to buy in the legal sector given the same prices. Many people tell me now the legal, the, due to the taxes, cultivation tax, fees, et cetera, et cetera, uh, 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 the cost of a legal ounce is about double the cost of an illegal ounce. I don't, we could do another audience participation. I would ask you, <laughs> I would ask you where you're buying your stuff, you know? Um, but you know what I'm talking about. So the question then is for this, how do revenues change with taxes? And people are trying to estimate this now. Again, we don't have a lot of data because in a lot of places it's brand new, um, you know, being able to buy legal marijuana. How responsive are legal users to price? Again, if you start raising taxes on legal, forget about the illegal sector. What is that called elasticity? How much less are people going to buy? And finally, how responsive are illegal users to price? That is, once we get the price down so it's the same, 
My guess is that illegal people would be like, no, I want to go into you know, a retail store where I can use iPads to pick you know, particular quantities, qualities, whatever. That's a guess. Now, I keep hearing a bunch of things like it's changing prices of real estate, whether it's the odor or people don't want to be near it. Um, we hear lots of chatter concerning these sales and prices. The ag sector, we just don't have enough turnover yet to really say whether there's a distinctive trend or not. But we do for residential. So, so this comes from the county recorder's office. Um, <clears throat> these are the number of sales of houses, single family residences by city. What you can see is, and by the way, um, it was voted on in 2016. 2017 is kind of when uh, it became legal recreationally. I don't see anything. I don't see anything in sales. And this is sale price. By the way, this green one up here, as you can see, that's Montecito. Big increase in Montecito because they loved being near Carpinteria, I think, and smelling it. But um, again, I just don't see anything in the data that's basically saying there's much going on in sales prices for houses uh, after we, we saw this legalization. It may well be that it's going to happen, it's going to take time, but right now we really can't see anything. Um, uh, this is Carpinteria here. So Carpinteria, you know, again, it's kind of flat, um, not really seeing anything there. So let's talk about some recommendations. And uh, again, I got to talk to Gabe from the Legislative Analyst's Office, uh, what they're doing. Uh, they came out with a report just recently uh, on, on, on cannabis. And the question is, you know, what is the goal? So if the goal is, for example, to reduce the size of the illegal market, then one way to do it is to reduce taxes in the legal sector, get the prices more closely in line. Number two, how would they do that? You're going to see they're thinking of eliminating the cultivation tax. So one of the recommendations by the Legislative Analyst Office is to remove the cultivation tax. Reduce the harmful effects, or maybe um, uh, about potency. So the other thing they're recommending, again, if this is your goal, I'm not saying it's my goal or your goal, if that's the goal, instead of taxing weight or all kinds of things, you tax potency. So some places have already done it. Illinois is doing it. And what you do is you tax on the amount of THC in the, uh, in the marijuana. So you just tax potency. If, you, if you're worried about high potency things are worse, you put higher taxes on it. Um, so again, you know, it's all economics at the end of the day. If you want to reduce tax collection and compliance costs, which is costing us a lot of money, what would you do? You could just tax and collect at retail. Why have the cultivator send money to the first distributor who sends it to them? It's just insane. Um, I hope nobody here made up that rule, so I apologize. Um, <laughs> so let's see what I mentioned about policy evaluation. Policy evaluation basically is what the legislative analysts are trying to do. So here's an example. What they're saying is, look, suppose they decide to um, keep the cultivation tax at the current rate, keep the current rate, what are they going to get in terms of legal versus illegal? They're not going to get anything legally. They didn't do anything different. Now what if they eliminate, which is their recommendation, what if they eliminate the cultivation tax? And at the same time, they reduce the excise tax to 11% from 15%. What do they imagine? Well, they think that they will see a rise in legal consumption of 6 to 20%. They will see a decrease in tax revenue, right? Because what's happening is you've gotten rid of this tax, and et cetera. If you eliminate the cultivation tax, um, keep the, cur the current tax rate, you can see that legal se sector will go up. And by the way, again, that comes from two places, the illegal sector falling, moving over to the legal sector, and, and not many people stopping to buy in the legal sector. Um, and then you can see what happens if you uh, keep the, um, uh, if you eliminate the cultivation tax, yet you raise the excise tax, you can see that they're not sure. Maybe a little bit less people in legal, maybe a little bit more. They're not quite sure. Again, you're kind of close to this, what I'll call this Laffer curve. 
There is a, there is a system called track and trace uh, that the state of California is putting in. It's actually kind of fascinating to watch. It will be more fascinating when it works. Uh, but but it, uh, it essentially tags barcodes the plants from the time that they come out of the a seedling pot. They have a tag on them and it runs all the way through the processing piece. And that, that tag has to follow that plant all the way through that process. The goal is that eventually every marijuana, every cannabis plant, marijuana plant in the state of California will be tagged and tracked and it will make tax compliance auditing much easier. So this was the revenue uh, over the last five quarters. This is uh, net revenue to the, uh, to the county in, in millions of dollars. Uh, we will know more uh, probably after the second quarter report about whether the trend is it will continue on this on this uptick, uh, we budgeted uh, conservatively. The budget for fiscal year 18-19 uh, was 5.7 million dollars, and we came in at about 6.9. Uh, so it, this is uh, and if this holds, uh, we'll probably move in the direction of 11 or 12 million dollars in, in tax revenue. Uh, looking ahead, uh, these are the challenges that we face, uh, particularly focusing on the unlicensed operators uh, and the people who are not uh, paying their taxes or not complying. Uh, there's all kinds of, uh, the state is continually modifying their regulations. The county will undoubtedly continue to modify our regulations. Uh, but probably the biggest thing is the bottom bullet point is the need to um, uh, better uh, connect uh, and better integrate land, the land use and business licensing process. Talked about track and trace. Uh, there's uh, the second bullet point is really about the issues of what's happening with marijuana pricing. And then there are um, going to be larger cultivation licenses coming uh, beginning in 2023. So with that, uh, I want to thank you for your time. I, I probably could spend a couple hours talking about this, but you probably can't. Uh, and we have some other great speakers that are fascinating. So thank you for your time and attention. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you very much, Barney. Uh, next speaker is going to be John Olgren. John Olgren's with Radius Ranch, who is the uh, pretty much the ag specialist in, uh, in that space. So John, welcome. Hi. Good evening, good evening everybody. How's everyone doing? Um, perfect. So I want to give a brief overview on how ag zone real property transactions have been affected by this new cannabis market the last couple years and where we are presently and where I think we are headed. Um, and this involves a, a lot of moving parts, as everyone knows. The last couple years, we've seen pre-application properties uh, receive, you know, properties that are on market receive full asking price or better uh, with the... Uh, you know, asking for the owners to cooperate and hang in there for long escrow periods, uh, heading towards permitting. Um, and that, that market's largely over at this point, and I think that, was, that had we a lot of failure rate, because as that was happening, the, the ordinance was being revisited, and, you know, oftentimes both buyers and sellers didn't really know uh, what kind of success rates those transactions were going to have, and so it was a... Uh, a learning by doing process. Um, Off-market properties that, in my experience, uh, you know, might have had you know better attributes. You know, pl you know, properties where owners were called that weren't actively for sale uh, had buy higher success rates because they were chosen for certain uh, attributes. And some of those properties uh, went into escrows that were one and a half to three times what would have been uh, intrinsic or appraised value, non-cannabis appraised values at that time. Um, you know, a lot of these escrows include, you know, long contingency periods, but then at some point releases of hard money uh, to keep the seller involved. And, and, and definitely some of these have gone on a lot longer than expected. Um, so in process pricing, so properties that are being uh, marketed or seeking deals that already have a permitting uh, process going on, I think we, we're actively in this stage right now. Uh, because of the, the expenses involved, a lot, of, a lot of things in this stage are being marketed, and pricing will be dependent upon what the likelihood of permitted acres ends up being. And so sometimes there might be a calculation 
on total permitted acres and pricing dependent on that permitted acreage success rate of getting through the LUP, CUP, business licensing, et cetera. So fully operating with financials, as Barney mentioned, I mean, we're in single digits of properties out there that are fully licensed with LUPs, business licenses, state licensing. So we just don't have the data for that. And so we'll see where that all lands. And that will also be um, you know, dependent on pricing of cannabis products because it is a commoditized market and where that ends up heading. So challenges for investors. The biggest challenge has been funding sources. Um, and so we've seen joint venture projects with existing landowners and high net worth individuals. Um, we've seen seller carry back type situations. And then we've seen hard money, which typically for cannabis is in the range of 12 to 20 percent. Um, so lack of, lack of access to market rate financing uh, presents a lot of challenges. As you're going to hear from Laurel in a minute about banking and so forth, we're still a long ways out from having um, you know, traditional financing for cannabis transactions, and that will keep uh, sales multiples down. I believe when we do get into the point where there are uh, fully licensed and permitted operations selling, those multiples will be lower than we see in other businesses because of the, uh, the constraint on financing. So as Barney mentioned, permitting and licensing timelines have been a challenge, um, certainly in some of the first phase properties that I've been involved in. Uh, an LUP has been obtained, and then when the business license inspections begin, there's a whole new set of guidelines that are not in line with the guidelines of the LUP. And so I really commend the county on the change and, and putting those together. I'm now seeing a couple projects where uh, they are moving forward at the same time, where there's you know, more active communication between uh, planning and development and law enforcement and so forth. And so, um, you know, and I want to just take a minute also to say, you know, kind of reflect how far we've gone uh, in terms of this new industry as a county. And I know it's been contentious out there and there's been a lot of, a lot of things aired and talked about. I, I personally kind of feel like we reached a flashpoint last summer uh, when the ordinance was revisited and there were some changes made, especially in the North County where I do a lot of work, um, disallowing cannabis on smaller parcels. You know, I mean, I have friends, neighbors, and clients in all property classes. Um, and so I, I'm pretty optimistic about where we're headed right now, at least from my standpoint. Of, uh, of working in a lot of these projects with clients and stakeholders, et cetera. And uh, so what I think we're going to see now is we're going to see a race to the cap. And a lot of the problems that people have expressed that they've had with cannabis in the county, with properties or locations that don't feel that fit their community, well, those, pro those, those projects are going to be held up. And projects that have neighbor buy-in from the very beginning that have um, you know, you know, no appeals, they're away from municipalities, there's non-riparian water, they have established farming histories. Those properties, and I think there's a few out there that still even haven't been, uh, applications haven't been submitted, I think those ones that really fit and work are gonna jump ahead of a lot of other projects, and so a lot of these problems are gonna solve themselves in the process we're already involved in. Um, so I, as of right now, I think, we're, I think we're over the hump of the hardest part of this, and, uh, and I think we're going we're to see some, some interesting new projects out there. And so, you know, one thought I had, which is a little tongue-in-cheek, is that, you know, maybe some people, if they oppose a project in their direct neighborhood, their best move might be to go out and support a project that they think is in the right location, that's away from schools, away from municipalities, has all the attributes. We've heard the supervisors and planning commission talk about, you know, where they'd like to see it. Well, you know, some of these projects are in the queue, and so I encourage people to get out there. If, you, if you're, you know, if, if, you know, groups like, you know, people that are for responsible cannabis, well, get behind a project that you think's responsible. That'd be my two cents, uh, and cap out the ones that aren't responsible. Um, so, yeah, based on that, so the, you know, the continual revisitation of the ordinance, you know, all the people in this industry, we're all on email threads that, uh, you know, hang on every word of a planning commissioner. And each time it's, we're going to revisit the ordinance or something like that comes across, there's a chill that runs through investors. And that makes it more difficult, and I think that's less efficient for us actually getting the right projects through with the right financing, because you can see at these rates of 12 to 20 percent or high net worth people putting significant money into this, you know, the best thing we could do from an investment standpoint as a county is to have a stabilization of our ordinance where there's a clear path and there's some decision making that has consistency. And don't get me wrong, overall I think we're doing a good job, but I think we can continue to do better. Um, and then, 
Yeah, I'd like to see with that, you know, fact-based decisions. You know, there's a lot of opposition out there that has some facts behind it. There's also a lot of opposition out there that I see that's fear-based. And so I think it, we would all benefit as a community with fact-based decisions in regards to this. Um, and, uh, you know, another thing, there's just one more prediction. I think it's inevitable we're going to see synergies with the wine industry uh, in North County. And I know that there's been a lot of talk about conflicts with the wine industry, but the vineyard owners that I know and talk to regularly and the winery owners that see a little further down the line, they will benefit first if they figure out how to synergize. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, next speaker is uh, Laurel Sykes, who's the uh, Compliance and Risk Officer for American Riviera. Uh, welcome, Laurel. Thank you. <clears throat> So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the banking industry. Um, and we've heard a little bit about what's happened at the, at the state level in the laws and regulations. And I'm going to give you a little bit of history on the federal regulations, because that's what banks are subject to as federally insured depository institutions. Uh, let's get started here. Um, so brief history on marijuana. In 1850s, cannabis was readily available in, in pharmacies. You could go buy it just about anywhere. Um, it was actually legal when liquor wasn't right? Um, pharmaceutical laws at that time were created on a state-by-state -state basis until Congress passed the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937. Um, ultimately, that was deemed as um, unconstitutional in 1970 because it required people to basically self-implicate if they were using marijuana for, for medicinal use. Um, but they replaced it with something called the Controlled Substances Act. Now, I'm sure you've all heard this, right? We need to reclassify marijuana. That's, that's everybody's solution to everything. Um, and it is kind of odd, because under the CSA, a Schedule I drug is one that's deemed to have no medicinal use at all, right? And here's marijuana. And we hear studies about how it can help people. Then we had, in 2018, the Farm Bill was modified to declassify hemp from the definition of marijuana. Now, that is a very, very um, tricky situation because while it's been declassified, it still requires that less than 0.3% of that product be THC. Another chart on the history of, of state laws and, and how they've all matched. Look, California, we were the first, 1996, right? Um, well, Santa Barbara, we used to be the number one um, uh, uh, a county here in the state of California for growing licenses. So we, we were number one, right? Well, we're not anymore. We're a little bit behind uh, Humboldt there uh, on the chart, but we still do have a lot of business in this county, and that's why we're all here. So what are the other legal and regulatory restrictions for banks? Um, despite state laws, we may be subject to issues at the federal level, right? I mean, we have the Bank Secrecy Act to think about. We've got the Controlled Substances Act, and if we are found to be aiding and abetting somebody in violating federal law, we can get in trouble as bankers. Um, there's also civil provisions. We talked a little bit earlier about the risks of, of banks lending to the industry. That's because if we lend on a property that has found to be like housing a marijuana-related business or accepting cash, um, and that property gets seized, and I've seen it happen, I've seen, I've seen a letter from the, from the Fed that says, oh, by the way, you're, you're your client may be doing something untoward. And lo and behold, if we didn't get rid of the tenant in that building, uh, our collateral would have been impaired. So FinCEN, who uh, is responsible for the Bank Secrecy Act, came out with some guidance, and they basically said, if you're going to bank the industry, here's all the things to think about. And they gave us this list of red flags that I did not put up here because the font would be so tiny, you wouldn't be able to read any of it. But one of the ones that really pops out to me is, if you find a business that is acting as a front, for a marijuana business, like a management company. And maybe they're managing money for the marijuana shop, but aren't forthcoming in the fact that they're servicing the industry. You have to report them to the federal government. So, so what do we have to do with marijuana? This FinCEN guidance is pretty robust. We have to verify the business is licensed and that it's registered with the state. So now I got to know where to go and what the licensing requirements are. I have to review the documentation and make sure it's legit. How do I know if it's legit? I have to request information on the business and the related parties. That's the part people don't know. Back in 2018, FinCEN came out with this rule called beneficial ownership. Anybody familiar with this? Has anybody opened a bank account for a business in the last couple years? It's gotten pretty rough, right? 
we have to drill down to the 25% individual owner of every entity. So you give me an LLC because you're trying to protect the interests of the members of the LLC, I gotta keep asking you until I get to that one person that owns at least 25% of the business. And I need their social security number and their address and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, thanks, Vincent. They've basically turned banks into law enforcement, which is completely unfair. I think really they should put the burden on the licensing agencies for the businesses, but that's just me. Um, the other thing that's challenging is we actually get regulated. We get examiners that come in at least every 12 to 18 months and they look at this stuff for four weeks, sometimes four and five examiners at a time. So the good news is if you're, if you're banking with a bank instead of a credit union, then they're really highly regulated. They're held accountable to all these rules and regulations and they pay their taxes. It's a tax night, right? We're talking about taxes. Um, negative news. We need to monitor and Google and watch what's going on anytime somebody gets busted. And the worst thing I ever have to do is call a client and ask them about something that I saw in the press because it's just not a fun conversation. Ongoing monitoring of account activity for red flags. That red flag I talked about, it's one of like 16 where you have to know if it's a management company that's acting as a front for marijuana. And then update the profile periodically for what's expected activity for that customer. Now, how am I to know, right? I get an invoice that's supposed to be a lease payment. And it's an invoice that says $35,000 from so-and-so. And it was cash. Well, how do I know if that's market? Now I need a copy of your lease agreement. And now I need to see what's really going on. I mean, how do I know what these facilities are like? Um, at prior institution, I, I was uh, going on a couple of those uh, tours of the greenhouses in Carpinteria because they're great. You know, it's a, the industry really wants us to understand their predicament. They want us, they're very open to come see our shop, come see our situation. So here I am, you know, heels, suit. I don't know why I haven't learned. I just don't. I just, it's like granimals. You don't have to think about it when you pull out of your closet. But, you know, I'm walking through greenhouses and there's pot lying on the ground and you see the, the buds that aren't even going in the bags thinking, oh my gosh, how much money is that going? And you're, you're trying to step so that you can understand what's going on and, and see that, oh, it's, it's odor abatement. It's beneficial bugs instead of pesticides. It's a very fascinating industry. And you're touching things, realizing, oh, there's probably oils getting on my pants. I have to go teach financial literacy in my kid's class in two hours. I'm going to smell like a pot farm. But anyway, how am I as a banker supposed to understand the industry to know what's expected for a customer? Um, other considerations, we talked about the costs and the safety issues, um, lack of transparency into financial transactions, because if they're banking the MRBs, a lot of these invoices are just flat dollar amounts, right? And we're trained when we're looking for money laundering. If someone buys a car from a dealership for $25,000 even, it's probably not legit because there's always sense, there's always tax, right? But yet we get the even dollar amounts from the industry. So we're trained to look for that. Um, branded card networks. So MasterCard Visa won't open up merchant card services for the industry. And we as bankers can't provide those services to those clients for that reason. The Federal Reserve prohibits it because it's federally legal, so we can't send wires. And we run the risk of not being able to send wires as a bank if we get in trouble for this kind of stuff. And there's a lot of implications for this whole unbanked industry, right? They have, to, they have to pay their taxes in cash, and then they get fines on top of it because they're paying in cash instead of electronically. There's tax consequences for payroll taxes. I think it's a 10% fee when you're not doing that. So I had this idea as Peter was talking that, you know, in addition to this, to this curve, we could create our own, maybe like the, the Canavasian curve. We're like, at what level of taxes do people start evading paying the taxes, like what, where's the right point? But you know, that's just, that's just a way that you can get yourself on that, on that curve yourself. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to talk through, you probably hear about tiering. The only place that tiering exists is in the um, banking industry. There's a company called uh, the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists, ACAMS, and they've come up with tiering. Tier one is directly touching the plant, Tier two is a non-plant touching business, but they derive a significant amount of money from the industry. Now, a lot of banks will bank tier twos, but they're gonna ask a lot of questions and it's really expensive for us to be monitoring them. We have to look at them every 90 days, all the time, just constantly. And if we're not making money because we're not able to charge for services or whatever it is, then banks aren't gonna bank it. Tier three is 
pretty much everybody else, right? We all have some sort of involvement. We're paying somebody somehow that's involved in the industry. Um, but you know, it might be the the landlord. It might be the uh, the attorneys. You know, attorneys is another high risk industry that we're supposed to look at. If they're accepting cash, where's it coming from? So we talked about the farm bill. Uh, the USDA came out with an interim final rule about hemp in December of 2019. It still doesn't really give us any guidance. Um, and then we're still waiting on what's happening with the Safe Banking Act. We know that it passed the House, but Senate doesn't seem to love it so much, as I mentioned. I think we need some help to, to really craft it in a way that's gonna be, gonna be passed. And, and to me, if we came up with a rule that created maybe an application process for a bank, so that a bank had to get clearance in order to safely bank the industry, rather than just saying, everybody has no liability, I think we'd be a lot better off. And there we go. Thank you, Thanks, you guys. That was great. Great, thank you, Sarah. Thanks, John.